message from the chairman that she hopes to join us, uh, subject to transport being on time. But um, in the meantime, let's um, proceed with the meeting. Um, first of all, can we have declarations of interest? Um, and on that subject, before going further, I am declaring an interest in the climate change risk prevention um, this item, which is number six, because Trusco has two projects uh, included in that um, uh, list of um, items for approval to go forward. Um, but could I have interests around the table, please? Chairman, general interest in transport matters as coordinator of FRIST. Thank you. I have uh, declared interest in the, uh, having a, a small share in the steamship company. I possibly have an interest in item nine because in some of the consultation papers it does mention a bus service, but I'll, I'm, I don't intend to lead the room, but if there's a discussion on it, I will lead the room for that brief moment because it's not really pertinent to the whole thing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just to be on the safe side, I'll declare my usual small interest of number of shares in the steamship company, though I can't see there's anything directly involved on the agenda. Um, and likewise, I'll add that to my previous um, statement of interest. Um, just moving on to the minutes of the two previous meetings, uh, the 4th of June and the 17th September, this committee. Um, taking the 4th of June first, could I have a proposal that these are a correct record? I'll propose. Second. All those in favour? That's passed. <coughs> Moving on to the meeting of 17th September, uh, could I have a proposal? I'll, I'll propose those as well. Uh, all those in favour? Thank you very much. <coughs> That's passed. Um, I've no urgent items as far as um, I'm aware, so we could move on to part one, which are reports requiring a decision. Um, and the first of those is item four, which um, is budget monitoring. Now, I've been advised by officers that, unfortunately, there is no documentation or a report on budget monitoring, um, which potentially is a serious shortcoming, I think, um, because obviously it's very, very important covering all the aspects that this committee is responsible for. Um, so could I ask um, the Senior Manager of Infrastructure and Planning just to update us on why this has occurred and how we're going to put it right. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Because of issues in terms of closed down and also some of the issues that we've had with our budgets, particularly including waste management where we need to reprofile the budgets, it was felt that it would be, at this stage, quite confusing to actually present some of the budget information that we have today. There's also, if I'm, if I'm being really frank, there's a couple of inaccuracies <coughs> in the budgets at the moment. We're well aware of those inaccuracies. We're well aware of the, of the need to reprofile the budget. And we've actually now have a series of meetings with the finance department to ensure that certainly by the next Teddy meeting, there will be budget monitoring uh, information available. And it might be that what we will try to do is actually get some budget monitoring information to members actually sooner than that. I mean, it should take, it's a piece of work that we're working on at the moment. And that work should actually be complete within, I would say, around about a month, okay? But please bear with us. I know it's not, uh, it's not an ideal situation to be in, but, you know, we are actually working on it, so, w you know, we do know where the shortcomings are, and we do know how to resolve the, the issues. Um, Councillor Sims. I, I just, I, I'm aware how fluid things are at the moment with, with your, the budgets. I just maybe a suggestion that it could be presented to Finance Audio, or not Audio, Audit and scrutiny, and scrutiny, I think it's 1st of December, that might be an idea, then it's, then it's out there a little bit, and that probably the timeline's okay for you, isn't it? 
Uh, Chairman, I think that's probably a very good suggestion. Um, I'll report back to uh, obviously I'd, the session. I'd, one I'd, that's a moment, I'd second that. I think that it, it, it is important that we know where we are, certainly before Christmas, I would have thought. Not no. all members of this committee are on the finance audit, so I would appreciate full involvement separately. And also, I'd like to ask whether the Chairman and Vice-Chairman of this committee have been involved in the discussions mentioned by the Senior Manager. Um, I think it's a, a good proposal to um, take it to a um, Finance Scrutiny Committee um, in early December. But equally, I would have thought members of this committee ought to be circulated with information uh, at a similar time. So if we can make that a target, I think that's um, absolutely right. Um, the Vice Chairman and I had a meeting with officers last Friday um, when it was clear that there wasn't going to be sufficient financial information. So the answer is we haven't seen figures, but we've been made aware of the position. Um, and I think given all the changes in the finance department and so on, I don't think it's unreasonable, but I think it needs to be put right as soon as possible. Chairman, so, am I not right in thinking if it goes to the FAS committee at the beginning of December, it will be automatically public record, so the, yeah. it will be available to everybody? Yeah, yeah. Uh, which I think would achieve its objective. But at the same time, members of this committee who aren't on FAS could, um, it should, should be circulated by mail, I think. That was my intention, really. I just didn't want it... And uh, disappearing until February, really. That was so, so essentially, yeah, anybody, it's available for anybody. And if certainly anybody else would like to come to the meeting, they can, can't they? Right. So I don't think we need to vote on that as such, because I think that's fairly clear where we're going. Um, item five is Porthmellon Enterprise Centre. And the, um, the issue here is to agree the fees and charges with uh, the various detailed recommendations that have been made by officers. <clears throat> so could I ask our Senior Manager for Strategic Development to... Yeah. Thank you very much. The building's now complete. It, we've been delayed from actually occupying it because of delays with broadband infrastructure, which took t over 23 weeks, which has been more than a little frustrating. We have our first tenants moving in on the 1st of November. We've had the final broadband line put in yesterday. We couldn't occupy the building without the broadband because our building management system and our fire alarms are dependent on it. So without that, it's illegal to occupy the building. Um, you'll see that the fees and charges are very similar to that which we discussed when we first looked at the project, probably two or three years ago now but I need formal agreement that these are acceptable. They're based on district valuation fees and they're based on um, actual costs with a small uplift to obviously support reinvestment into equipment and one thing and another. So if you have any questions. Uh, Councillor Bellsborough has a question <coughs> regarding Yes, Chairman. Um, <coughs> I've looked up these rents for the room hire, etc., etc and discover there's a 20% VAT being added onto the rent. On looking up the rules from the Inland Revenue, which I've got a copy of here, uh, one item says, lettings are exempt, or uh, letting a property is exempt from VAT, but the landlord may, with some exceptions, exercise an option to apply VAT to a letting. Yep. It seems as though we have the option. Shall, so I, shall I explain why? Yes. We have. Yes, certainly. It's for two reasons. One is that because of the short in and out, these are, <coughs> these are licenses to occupy, they're not leases for the main part of the building. If it's a license to occupy, VAT becomes applicable rather than a lease. So that's one of the reasons. The second reason is that we opted to um, claim the VAT from the building. Therefore, we're, we're legally required to bat the, bat the rooms afterwards, if that makes sense. Yes, but it, as I read this, it is an option. N and that, op well... well. We, we've taken legal advice, and this is what our legal and financial advisors have told us we have to do. Generally speaking, if, you, um, if you've reclaimed VAT on the building costs, you're have to charge VAT on the outcomes. Well, I only add about 
under half a day to check this, but, but I have printed off the pages which I'll email to you, yeah. and then you can decide. Well, well, if we do have the option, it seems wrong to increase the rents by 20% if we've no need to. I, I don't disagree, but our legal advice is that we have to. Well, <coughs> yeah, just, I will hold off on this, Chairman, until I've done some more. With all due respect. Yeah, just, just to clarify, it's, yes? it's not a, a lease. It's, it's, an, it's a license to occupy we're talking about, not a lease, letting of a property. But it says here, room hire. Yeah, that's what it is. That's not, that's not a lease, Gordon. Leases are VAT exempt. Room hire is not necessarily so. Well, OK, I'll leave it, Chairman, and, and continue my research. Thank, thank you thank very you. much. Uh, Councillor McCarthy, we've got a comment. Yes, th thank you, Chairman. Um, I I'd like to know... Um, who it was took 23 weeks to actually do the necessary work and, and um, what was their reason for doing it, um, for taking so long? It was BT and we actually had to, or open reach in this case, we had to escalate it to um, chief executive level within the BT group itself just because it was, it was incredibly painful. So, so, so super fast broadband came, came with a super slow connection. Yeah, yeah the, the broadband's very fast. Yeah. The connection is more challenging. And did they give a reason for, 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 I mean, six months is, or nigh on six months isn't very clever, is it? No, there seems to be, if it's a new connection, that seems to be, it was more complicated because we needed four lines. So that made it more complex, though we'd already put all the lines in, all they had to do was connect them. But it's just the way I think it is at the moment with open reach. I think everybody's struggling with exactly the same situations. I can confirm on the mainland yes. it can take over a year. They're very fond of putting nice green boxes which make you feel optimistic and then nothing happens thereafter. Um, <coughs> but. <clears throat> if, um, unless anyone else has uh, comments on... Oh, sorry. Um. Um, Chairman, I agree on the difficulty. I tried to put four new lines in this sum, and yes, it took ages. Um, but I just wanted to ask about the affiliate membership. Yeah. Um, what does that mean? Who's eligible? And what does it give you? Anybody is eligible. And if you look, there's a, if you click on this online, this will open up the little one here which gives Correct. you all the information but an affiliate membership gives you um, a post box you can go down there and work it gives you a business address it gives you cheaper meeting rooms it's, I think it's about 30 pound a month if I remember rightly and it allows you to have somewhere where you can take your clients if you work from home and you want somewhere that's a bit less homely if you see what I mean yeah. which many people do thank you Chairman, one small point. On page 15 and 16, it gives the supporting documentation. When I had my eyes checked not long ago, and I've got 2020 vision, I can't even read that with a magnifying glass. Are we trying to hide something? No, or? not at all. If you, it's an embedded PDF, so if you look at it on the, the internet and click on it, the whole document opens up. Okay. It's just that the documents... Not so much the first one, which is the information pack, but the Article 55 guidance is several pages long, and I didn't want ah. to attach that. It's a great big long document. Councillor Barrett, have you. Um... Yeah, oh, sorry. I would like to propose that we accept these fees and charges. They look reasonable, and um, we can test them out. I'll second that. Oh, sorry. Uh, being proposed and seconded. Yeah. Um, could we have all those in favour of accepting the fees and charges as recommended? That's passed. Oops. Um, next item I'm going to ask the Vice Chair to take because I shall leave the room on the basis of interest, um, which is the Priority Axis 5 Promoting Climate Change Adaptation Risk Prevention and Management, <laughs> which is uh, quite a confusing title, but no doubt the um, Senior Strategic Development Officer will explain. In that case, I shall pass straight over to... Uh, 
Senior Manager. Thank you very much. There's an opportunity arisen through Priority Access 5 of the European Regional Development Fund programme 2013 to 2020 to apply for funds for flood defences, which is the first time flood defence have been eligible for ERDF funding, otherwise we'd have done it previously. Um, we've responded to the call and the specific area that we've responded to is around dune management and um, dune system stabilisation, shoreline renourishment. And the reasons we've done that is that we already have £900,000 um, in the forward-looking environment agency plan for flood defences for St Mary's and the rest of the islands. And this was an area where we had a very small amount of money allocated, which allows for us to match with the environment agency money with the ERDF to do more dune management systems across the islands. Um, this may not be the definitive list. We have to do all the design work. We have to do all of the, the alignment work. But based on the work undertaken by Arup and the shoreline management plan, and in discussion with partners, specifically the Duchy of Cornwall and Tresco, as the landowners, this seems like the most sensible mix of projects alongside the other projects that we've already got allocated monies for from the Environment Agency. So with your permission, I've done an outline application for 771,000, which should be looked at, appraised, and we should have a decision by the end of November. If that decision is um, approved, if the project is approved at outline, I'd like your permission to go on and work it up as a full application. Just one comment from me before I open it up to uh, discussion is that uh, we've held discussions with Diana. Um, this is the opening shot. The figures that are quoted within there are obviously subject to change. They are uh, guesstimates at best, is that correct? Yeah, they've probably got about 60 to 65 percent cost certainty on the capital works. Um, until we do a lot more work on the design, it's very difficult to have any cost certainty. But what we will do is work within the envelope of monies, either from ERDF mm. and the Environment Agency. But this is an outline application, so it's not set in stone. Okay, Councillor Daly. Thank you, Chairman. <coughs> I, I see uh, we have, with Dales having no sea defences, which is entirely... S sorry, can you speak up? Yes. I see with Dales having no sea defences which is entirely accurate, but we do have a lot of dunes, and um, so I'm just wondering if we're going to be included. Well, the, the, we have to work off of the shoreline management plan and the Arab studies that were done, and unfortunate, unfortunately for St. Martins, they've identified that actually your dunes are in really good nick, they don't need support, and because you're, um, you're protected, pretty much by the other islands, actually your sea defences, your natural sea defences, your natural dunes are actually, don't require much work done to them. Okay. Councillor O'Neill. Um, yeah, I would fully endorse this. I thank the officer for the report. Um, I think anybody globally who lives in an island community knows the importance of this type of work and any assistance we can get with it, we should leap at the opportunity. I appreciate what you're saying that this is just an opening gambit effectively, but we need to be pursuing it and looking at the long-term goals. Um, out of curiosity, so just as a matter of clarity, I'd like to know if whether or not I myself am actually in the shoreline renourishment business. <laughs> mm, possibly <laughs> not. No. <laughs> nourishment, but not renourishment. Right, man, I, either way, I would still like to propose a recommendation. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Billsborough. Yes, I support this, Chairman. I have two questions. Supposing we didn't get all this money, and I know it's only an estimate, but supposing we fell short, uh, what would be the consequences to the islands? Well, this is, we already have money allocated from the, by the Environment Agency, which is based on a different set of criteria than this money. This money is all about protecting key infrastructure and protecting key properties and commercial properties. That's why you see some of its, mm. its mm. the way it's constructed. Um, if we don't get the money, we won't go ahead with these projects. These projects are, but 
are not identified by the Environment Agency as key projects moving forward. So, well, okay, I accept that. And my second question is addressed to Craig, really. Would it be reasonable to forbid any more building on low-lying land that is liable to flood? What do you think, Craig? Is the <coughs> Yeah, thank you, Councillor Bills, but it's a very uh, interesting question. I think, I think it really depends on the nature, scale of the development, its location. So I think there are a number of factors. So I think it's very difficult to give, if you like, a kind of blanket approach in terms of any planning policy. But clearly it's one of the major issues that we need to look at when we're looking at the review of the local plan, particularly in terms of where we're actually identifying new, new land for various uses, including housing and employment uses. Thank you. I was asking the question because um, within the lifetime of some of the younger people, the sea level is going to rise where part of Utah will be awash. And it's no good building walls higher and higher and higher. It's just one of those things. Councillor Bennett. Thank you, Chair. Um, I support the measures listed here, but I can't let the opportunity escape without mentioning Briar because anybody who saw the flooding on Briar in February 2014 um, would be aware that of the um, great potential for cutting the island in two. And although the things under threat are not immediately of value, monetary value, like the hotel, like the water supply, in fact, what is the intrinsic value of the island as a whole? The previous um, sea defence consultants, when they put in rock armour along popple stones, um, estimated the life of that bit of land holding Samson, um, Rushy Bay to the rest of the island um, of 40 years. Well, those years are slipping away and last year demonstrated a real, real danger. Um, Rushy Bay, the contours of it came back a good 100 yards. So the sea was waving in that, and that, all the erosion. Yes, it's recovered, but there's going to be a point when it doesn't. And the island, it is under threat from flooding there. Yeah, and what I'd like to say is this is not all the money that we've got for flood defences. As the lead flood risk management authority, which the council is, which is why we're making this application on behalf of all the islands, otherwise you'd have applications from Dutchie and applications from Tresco and possibly applications for us where it's applicable. Um, but as the lead, we, we take the lead in doing the application. But we also have the access to the funding from from the Environment Agency for floods and Briar is m because that's more hard defenses <coughs> Briar is much more um, aligned to that pot of money than it is to this dune management softer type of defense what yeah. money unfortunately I mean I agree I hear what you're saying and I agree that this should go ahead this grant application but nevertheless when the formula is often a pound for a pound of um, infrastructure to be saved by sea defence, mm. then, by I'm afraid, the prospect looks very gloomy. Yeah, I, I hear what you're saying, but likewise, what Diana's just said is there's another pot of money for that. Um, yes, and so that, that's the pot of money with those criteria. Yeah, yeah, but we're talking about the soft management here rather than the hard one. Okay. Councillor McCarthy? Yes, there's a similar issue, I think, on parts of St Agnes, the, the, the area around Horse Point, um, north, of, north of Horse Point, where the, where the, the water, came, speak, right, the, the water came right across in, uh, in, in the, the winter two years ago. Gordon can't hear you. Is that better? Right, sorry. No, I, I, similar situation on uh, a, a part of St Agnes. I just want a little bit of clarification. I'm not sure I entirely understand. The £900,000 that's mentioned on 1.6 that we've already got access to. Yeah. Does that then link in with paragraph 110? In other words, that's that's what it's deemed to actually yeah. support. Yeah. There's 200,000 pound in that 900,000 pound which is for dune management. So yeah. what I'm doing is using with the environment agency's permission using that 200,000 pound to match 
at 80% the money from ERDF, so that instead of 200,000, we get um, nearly 900,000 for just June management. Yes. And then the other 700,000 is there for other projects. Yes. Because um, obviously, I'm just, I mean, you're quite right to, well, Arup were quite right to identify not just Periglis, but Pekilia and Pekus, because both, you know, unless they are maintained, you don't have much point in actually dealing with Periglis. Mm. So, I'm, I mean, do we know that this £900,000 is, is actually going to stay, or From is the environment Mr. Osborne aid. going to take it away in November? Well, but I'm at a meeting tomorrow to discuss that £900,000. But as far as I understand from Environment Agency, it's a forward-looking six-year programme. It's already been identified previously in the CSR, and it's as safe as any money is, I imagine, in the current spending Situ regime. Yes, because we, we, we have got to wait till November, haven't we, for the comprehensive yeah. spending review to actually emerge. Okay, thank you. Okay, in the absence of any other questions... I, uh, can, we take, can we take it as one and two as one? I think, it, I think it's sensible. Yeah, we've got proposal, Councillor Bennett, seconder, Councillor Billsborough. All those in favour? Thank you. We'll wait for uh, Councillor Dorian Smith to come back in to take the next item. <coughs> So we move to item seven, which is the waste and recycling report. Um, principal issue here is for us to approve purchase of second hand refuse vehicle. Um, explanations are given as to why this is the preferred option over leasing or hiring um, a vehicle. Um, could I ask if officers have got any uh, explaining further that needs to be done? Um, yeah, so members agreed, um, if you recall from this committee, um, last February, the lease of a refuse collector vehicle. Um, and since that time, we've been working with the maintenance and repair section of the council. They've undertaken um, a bit of work around that. And it would seem the hire of a second-hand vehicle is actually not cost-effective for the council and that a purchase of a second-hand one would be uh, more cost-effective and it can depreciate over time with um, a date of 2025. Uh, so that's that really, it's just a technicality yeah. just to say we could purchase instead of leasing. Uh, uh, thank you. Does anyone have any comments on that? Oh, Councilman Neil. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Only just to say that I think it is just a technicality, but I know from speaking to the guys actually on the ground, like, you know, at the coalface, as it were, that they are desperate for this and we need to support them and we need to get this yeah. resolved as soon as possible so that they can continue providing the service and the excellent work that they do on a daily basis. Vice Chair. Yeah, I, I support this entirely and uh, would urge the... Uh, officers involved as a matter of urgency to get it sorted because I spoke to them yesterday and apparently Vosa have taken one off the road yesterday. Yeah, we are replacing the smaller vehicle at the moment. That is happening. We've purchased a smaller one to replace the one so we can service the garrison area. Um, it's just the larger vehicle now that we need to, we need to procure. That is in hand. <coughs> Recommendations yes. proposed. I support this, Chairman. There is one small point uh, on waste disposal. A question I've asked before, and I didn't like the answer, so I'll ask it again. Um, if a domestic person, uh, uh, resident, uh, disposes of a piece of rubbish and they have a car, they take it down to the tip, and that's the end of it. If they have a piece of domestic uh, waste that's too heavy to carry, and they use a carrier to take it down, not only does the carrier charge them, but they're charged again as commercial waste. Now, surely I'm, it's I'm not... I'm sorry, that's not really the agenda item here. We're actually... Well, no, but it's, it's on waste 
But, well, uh, yes, but it's not. This is specific to the vehicle. It was a good try, Chairman, uh, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I, I, think, I do remember you raising that issue before, but I don't think yes, it's to do with this. Okay. Um, we have a proposal. Have, has anyone I just, I just wanted to ask, um, I know a considerable amount of work has gone into to procuring this vehicle. Have we got a sort of vague timeline on it? Because I, I know that the guys are really desperate for a new vehicle. Yeah, we're looking at the procurement of that now. Um, so I think it's around 10 days, I think, the contract is out for. So it's, so it's, it's going to be, it's to gonna be it's weeks to, as opposed to months. Yeah, That's yeah, what, definitely. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I'll second it. Thank you. Well, we've had a proposal and second uh, for the purchase of the... Chairman, there was... I've just got one question. It's on, uh, it's on 4.2, the incinerator. There's been a two-week delay on asbestos report. I just wondered, it says... Um, Demolition to be due to be completed by December uh, 2015. Can we have some clarification on that, please? Um, well, again, that's not the agenda item. It's, it's, in, I say so. it's in the report. Yeah. I, all right. Well, perhaps we can answer that question. <coughs> um, yeah. I mean, as far as I'm aware, uh, Councillor Guy, that's still on target to be completed by December 2015. So. Uh, this was partly owing to the nesting birds issue, wasn't it? That there was a delay. Has anyone ever seen the microphone in October? No. Well, no. <laughs> um, so we do have a proposal on the second step regarding the recommendation to purchase a second-hand refuse vehicle. Uh, could I have all those in favour, please? That's passed. Um, next item, number eight, is the airport update. Um, can I just ask, have we got figures for September with us? The figures, Chairman, uh, should actually, well, actually go up to September, I believe. We haven't, we haven't got September's figures. Yeah, yeah we have. So, so, so basically, oh, right. so, what, so what we have got, and the first thing I would say, actually, is apologies for the late distribution of the uh, monitoring report, but it does actually pro provide a broad uh, assessment of the performance, actually, from the beginning of April, as you'll see towards the end of September. So the figures we have are from April through to September. I, as again, I apologize uh, for the lateness in this report. What I would say is that it's quite interesting, since the beginning of the year, passengers have actually increased uh, slightly from the kind of predicted amount by around about 2,300 passengers, which of course has had uh, a corresponding impact in terms of the income. And I think what's really interesting is that arguably the biggest, biggest month of the airport, the busiest month of the airport, actually had a corresponding uh, decrease in the uh, amounts of passengers because we had 14 no-fly days, which obviously is, uh, is a, a, a significant number of no-fly days in what should be really the peak, the peak month. You'll see from the report, as well as highlighting some of the performance issues uh, for this, for the current financial year, the report also highlights the fact that, you know, we do need to continue uh, operations actually at the airport, and we do have an issue, certainly with one of the fire appliances, the Mark 10 fire appliance. It is getting very old, it's getting very difficult to maintain and repair economically, so uh, you'll see that there is a recommendation that to, in fact it's to note that we do actually purchase a second-hand fire appliance and that's really important because we need to be compliant obviously with the Civil Aviation Authority in terms of making sure that we do have sufficient fire cover for the airport. We do have, uh, we do have two fire appliances at the airport and it's important that we do have two fire appliances because obviously from time to time vehicles do break down and of course they do require servicing and it's simply just not logistically practical just simply to hire one in for the duration of, uh, of when one fire appliance is, uh, is obviously not functioning. So, uh, so the report, Chairman, is to note. And so do we require to decide whether to get the second fire engine now or what's the position on Ch that? Chairman, it, uh, my view is that this is an operational issue right. and because of the compliance issue in terms of safety, my view is that it, it, it is an operational decision that really does need to be made 
and that we do, we, you know, we don't really have much choice in this but to really purchase a fire appliance. We're going for a second-hand fire appliance. The one thing I would say is that I appreciate the lease issues, but this would be a transferable asset and it would be an asset which would be owned by the local authority. So it can actually be, you know, either resold or, you know, transferred as part of any, uh, any future change in operations. Um, I don't think this requires a vote as such because it's more um, of an update in the, the way I read it. But, um, but if any members have comments at all on our port matters, now would be the time. Uh, yes, I support this, Chairman. But if we look at page 31, paragraph 5.2, uh, near the end, it sounds as though the airport is now doing better than it did. Is that correct? You know, the finances are... It's under the, uh, as it says, more effective management. Is, is that correct, Craig? Chairman, yes, Chairman, I think there are a number of issues. We do have, we've been working, we have a new streamlined management structure at the airport. I think things such as cost control, I think, are much more effective now at the airport in terms of trying to reduce or minimise the operational costs of running the airport. Clearly, airports are expensive to run. There are times when we do need to replace kit and equipment. And I think, you know, what I would say is that in terms of going forward, there's always a requirement to actually build up reserves actually for the airport because obviously in the event what there will be a time when those runways will need to be resurfaced again probably in about 20 years so things are looking better at the airport financially no, passenger numbers are up clearly fees and fees and charges were increased this year as well and of course that will have a corresponding impact in terms of the income but having said that we cannot be complacent now, airports are expensive to run. We're doing everything we possibly can to make it as economically viable as, as, as possible. But it does mean that there is at least uh, some funding potentially available now for things such as the purchase of the second-hand vehicle. Excellent, sir. So it shows it can be done. So this begs the question, if the airport finances are improving, have we made the right decision <laughs> in surrendering the lease? Well, I think... Again, that's a separate item, but I think it's always been understood with anything to do with the airport that it's a numbers game. It was always, if we have more numbers through the airport, the better the chances of making it financially viable, regardless of who's running it. And as of now, whilst we're maybe 2,000 passengers up on last year, we've got to remember last year was not a particularly good year. In fact, it was a very bad year. So I think the things are going the right way, at least they're not 2,000 passengers down. Yes, but ask the question, Chair. It makes me wonder whether we did the right thing in giving up the lease. Well, if I we continue we, to improve, I can say there was no need to I, give I'm it sorry, up. That's not really for the, that's history now. We all voted to do so. It's recent history. Yeah. <laughs> it's recent history, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Councillor Bennett, do you have a. Thank you. I think um, we all have to remember very clearly that our. Passenger numbers at the airport are still not back to the 2012 level. Yes. Um, uh, the um, piece of paper here records 1,951 less passengers. It should be fewer, but um, <laughs> I don't. I'm not questioning the grammar. I'm questioning the statement. And yet, you say we're. Uh, passenger numbers have increased this year. September numbers were up on last September, but yeah. August numbers oh, were right. down, and I think the net effect, you just said the net effect was. Uh, Chairman, the net effect actually throughout the year, you know, even despite, you know, a bad August, is that, you know, we're about 2,300 passengers up on last year. On so the that's six the, Yeah, over the, uh, since the period from the beginning, yeah. the beginning of April. But what I would say is, and I'll echo that uh, Councillor Bennett's, Bennett's uh, uh, statement, is that if you recall, you know, the airport was actually getting up to about 130,000 passengers uh, sort of five, six, seven years ago. And you think 93,000 is significantly less than 130,000 passengers. <coughs> Chairman, we, we, we're never given, I know it's not on the airport agenda, but we never have the figures for the sea passengers, and yet sometimes these um, figures are just recorded as passengers. I know they're under the title of airport, but it would be so helpful to have 
total passenger numbers and then separate them A and C? Vice Chair. I'm not entirely sure, uh, Councillor Bennett, but that's within our remit on the grounds it's a private uh, operation and we've got no control over what comes in through the sea and <coughs> it could potentially be commercially sensitive information as far as a steamship company is concerned. It's funded. Yeah, but they don't, they don't necessarily declare the number of passengers that they bring in, though, because it is a private operation, is it not? Yes, I... Councillor Bennett, can I just ask that you put, use your microphone? Uh, I think as a, an authority with a responsibility for transport in the community and tourism, it is an essential statistic to have. Well, I, I think we have a, the option to ask either the Harbour Authority or the Steamship Company if they would mind sharing passenger figures, because I think both those bodies would have the passenger figures for the shipping. Can I request that such a request comes from this committee? Um, it's, well, it's slightly off topic, but I, uh, you know, I, I think that's something that we could <coughs> arrange if everyone supports that idea. Yes, we should also know, I think, yes. Um, sorry, Councillor McCarthy. Yes, I, I mean, I, I tend to agree with, with Councillor Bennett. You know, we're all in this together, and really and truly, it, in, in, it will be very helpful to, to know just how many people the steamship company were able to put on the Salonian during August. Uh, the point I was actually going to make is I just wanted to make sure this is, this is coming out of operational expenditure rather than capital expenditure, or is it a capital? It's a capital sum, is it? Chairman, this will actually just come out of the operational fund. It the will. Airport. Is that, and, that, and that's okay, is it? Uh, as things stand, yes, but what I would say is the finances of the airport obviously are still precarious and we still need to keep obviously tight controls. But it can't, budgets, it can't come but out some, of the capital budget. There's no capital. Some, some equipment, unfortunately, just does need to be purchased and replaced. Yes, I'm not querying that. I was just querying where, it's, where the money's coming from. Yeah. Well, just to, just to bear in mind for members, obviously, the airport is a trading account, so it can't, the airport money can't come from anywhere else no. apart from the airport itself, unless, of course, we borrow against the uh, airport itself. And again, I think it will be quite useful in future, perhaps to go back just a few more years, just to remind people of what the situation was. Just to go back to 2012, when numbers were higher than they are today, it would be quite useful just to go back, or not every year, but perhaps just to have a couple of years between 2002 and, and 2012, just to sort of put this, this situation in perspective. Thank you. Councillor Sam? Um, well, just uh, really referring back to what Marion just said about overall numbers. Now, I, um, at the club open day the steamship company did, I had quite a long chat with Rob Goldsmith, and he was quite buoyant, and he wasn't talking about the airport or the steamship company. And he said, basically, despite the worst weather, he, in his, his phrase was in the last eight years, um, that overall stayers were up by 9%, and the day trippers were up by, I think, four and a half or five percent. So I think overall that the figures are... Only one year. Only, only one year, admittedly, but <coughs> overall the, the figures are, they tally with the airport figures, so I, I do yeah. think it's <coughs> now, the come progress do. on a broad front. They do publish their figures at the end of the financial year. Yeah, but it was, uh, I think, nine percent for stayers, yeah. which is um, pretty positive. I mean, if that keeps up for 10 years, then we'll be way over where we were in 2002. Probably won't, though. But I think specifically on the airport, the fact that the ship's up is very good in yeah. wider context, but um, as far as the airport's concerned, it's not the key issue. Um, Councillor Daly. Chairman, we've just heard there was a lot of disruption this year, and yet we've got a report saying no days were lost. That's September. Chairman, that specifically does refer to September. It doesn't say that. Just oh. Well, uh, I think the document refers is the September update, um, and again, <laughs> I think grammar may well be <laughs> called into question yet. But, but I think uh, thank you for clarifying that. But uh, that is what the reference that I understood that it was it for is. September. Um, right. Well, if uh, if everybody's. Uh, happy with that one we could move on to agenda item nine which is the do we have a vote on whether we're going to buy this 
Well, apparently it's, it's to be treated as an operational matter, which doesn't really involve this committee okay. because it comes out of airport funding. So we ignore the recommendation. Well, I'm quite happy to offer a vote if that would make people Chairman, happy. sorry, I think technically we have to have a vote because Councillor Bennett made a proposition that this committee requests information from the steamship company, so I think we have to have a vote on that. Well, we may have a vote on that, but we don't have to, you know, the question of the other matter. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm, I'm still happy to propose whatever we want to propose. Well, look, sh should we be specific about what we're asking for? Should we ask for monthly figures in the same way as we get them for the airport from the steamship company on its passengers, and preferably a breakdown between day trippers and staying passengers? Well, I will second Councillor Bennett's uh, proposal. Uh, would everybody be in favour of that? That's passed. <clears throat> well, yes, that's a matter for them if they come back and say, no, it's commercially sensitive, but I think probably in the circumstances where they're the only provider of transport, they could share it with us, because it is an important part of overall strategy for the islands. So, um, thanks for that. Let's move on to item nine. And um, is that in with us? No. No, Chairman, I'll take this yep. report. Okay, thank you, Chairman. Uh, this report really just summarises some of the key issues that was raised uh, following a traffic and parking consultation. And that was very much predicated on the fact that obviously now we've resurfaced the roads, put in the new lines, just to give really some consultation in terms of how kind of effective or otherwise. Uh, the new roads and markings have actually been. You'll see from the report that we had a really good response. We had uh, 61 individual representations and that was really from a broad range of highway users. What I would say is the report doesn't set out any proposed measures or solutions to address the issues raised, but you'll see from the recommendations that it does uh, recommend the preparation of a new traffic regulation order and that will very much consolidate where, uh, where obviously the existing parking restrictions are, but also looking ahead to potentially some new uh, restrictions as well on the basis of the consultation report, but that will come back obviously to a later committee. And secondly, also what it recommends is a review of the strategic transport framework. Not a review of the strategic transport framework in its entirety, but very much focusing on developing a longer term strategy and action plan uh, to manage, uh, obviously, travel and transport on St Mary's. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, is anyone... How much would that cost? How much would this review cost? Uh, Chairman, difficult, difficult to say. What we will endeavour to do is actually do the, uh, do the strategy actually in-house, utilising uh, officers actually within the department itself. Well, I just want to thank Helen, really, for the amount of work she did in this. I did quite a lot of work with Helen on this, but she did 97% of it. Um, essentially, what we've got at the moment is we have a hodgepodge of road traffic orders, and this is to consolidate... Cons well, the, the word has gone, consolidate the whole thing under one, and also there are a number of areas which are not covered by existing road traffic orders which need to be fitted in, i.e. the... the by the dairy there, and it's, it's, a, it's a nightmare with parking and things like that. So basically this is to, to bring the whole thing in to make it sensible and easier to manage. And also there's a number of, if you look at the, I, I read all of them, um, a number of people, a lot of people are very concerned about push bikes and places to park push bikes. And so an element of it is um, putting possibly sheltered bike stands up uh, and uh, clarifying the, the one-way systems and everything. And it does say it will come back to full council because there basically wasn't enough time having, with all the responses, to get it all sorted out for this committee. So hopefully it's a, a more feasible, well, a, 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 a proper plan will come back to full council. <coughs> In, I think, December, isn't it? December 8th. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. I'd just like to endorse Councillor Simpson's comments there and thank the senior officer for the amount of work that I know has been put into this report. Um, I think it's absolutely necessary to, to pursue this and, as was pointed out again, the necessity to tie it up into one manageable 
logical order yeah. instead of the current situation is, is absolutely necessary and this is the best way forward and thank okay. everybody involved. Councillor Pellsbury. Yes, Chairman, we can't debate all the detail now but there is one which worries me and that is I, I see there's been suggestions that we have parking fees. Well, the, the, the logistics of collecting parking fees, etc., are enormous. So uh, we can't debate it now, but I mm. hope it doesn't come to that. Yeah. No. Ch sorry, Jim. The whole point of this is that we tie it up into one manageable boundary, and it's pre presented yeah. as a logical single issue report to full council so that we can discuss the nitty gritty detail then and move forward in a logical fashion. Absolutely. And then, so Councillor Daly's question was rele relevant. How would this be achieved given the six week with time frame? Whatever. Um, this, will, will this need external support or can we do it within the council? Chairman, I think we're trying to do as much of the work internally just to actually uh, save on costs. Uh, the, the realism, and I have questioned this actually with the senior officer in terms of getting actually the report back by, I think, by December, I think is, is certainly challenging. But we'll, we'll endeavour to do the best we can. And we, you know, because I do see this actually as being a priority piece of work and an urgent piece of work. And in order to capture, I think, the essence of that consultation, it's better that we actually press on now with the work rather than kind of, you know, any delays. Can't guarantee that everything will be uh, absolutely, uh, the whole report will be completely, com you know, finished by December. But certainly what we might do is actually give you an update in December in terms of where we're going. So give you, pardon the pun, a direction of travel in um, terms of some of the proposals. Councillor Sams, you... Yeah, I forgot. So I would recommend that members actually um, ask Helen to have a look at the, cons the consultation documents. It's a lot more in it than we've got here. And one thing that came up quite a lot, which uh, is, I think, just to get it on record, a lot of people were asking about disability parking spaces. Well, if you have a blue badge, you don't need a disability parking space. That's basically for car parks at supermarkets. If you have a blue badge, you can just park. So there's no need to the cat. In fact, it would be pointless to council putting them in because you can just park there virtually for as long as you want and there's no restrictions. Well, it sounds from what you said earlier as if there's quite a few um, issues which need to be pulled together under one roof. So I, I think there are, but I think I do recommend again that members have a look at the, the mm. paperwork that came in. It goes from the sublime to the ridiculous, <laughs> even on the same page, but it's very useful and it does highlight people's concerns really well. Right. So, uh, the, on the um, parking restrictions in the, the generally in Hewtown, um, the 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. It would be useful if it was from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. For um, the recommend, the, probably the recommendation will be that it goes from 8 p.m. 8 a.m. to 5 a.m. because the carriers yeah. have issues. So I yeah, think it would be useful. Yeah, that, that is that is came up quite a lot, and I think it will yeah. go forward as a possible change. Okay, thank you. Um, well, thank you very much. Shall we take part one then as a recommendation on its own? And if anyone cares to propose it and second it. Um, so, all those in favour of item one that we recommend that a new traffic regulation order is drafted. Thank you very much. That's passed. Um, uh, item two is for members to approve the review and update of this Arsenal City Strategic Transport Framework. Now, I imagine that is ongoing, is it not? Uh, Chairman, absolutely it is, yes, yeah, so uh, obviously hopefully we will uh, endeavour to get something back by, uh, by the next meeting of Teddy, but it is an ongoing piece of work. And it won't be a whole scale review, wholesale review actually of the document itself, it will very much focus on some of the travel and transport issues on St Mary's. Um, is everybody happy about that process? Can I just ask? Um, the extent of the um, framework, does it include mainland links? Does it? Chair Chairman, no, really, this report is really in terms of the traffic and parking consultation that was done in the context of St Mary's. So the review will be very much focused on just the travel and transport issues of St Mary's. It would be absolutely, it would, it would be so difficult, almost impossible to do a wholesale review of that document within a six week period. So should the title of the change that? I think this is a section of a larger document. I mean, this recommendation is very specific as St Mary's Highways. Um, 
So I think if we start widening it, as far as this recommendation is concerned, I, we, you know, we, we, we have, we know that there's the wider framework document exists. So my own view is that let's look at this recommendation as specific to St Mary's Roads for surface transport. Yes. yes. Chairman, I'd be happy with that revision. Right. Okay, the recommendation, Chairman, does specify St Mary's highways, including parking and traffic management, and therefore I'm prepared yeah. to propose the recommendation. Bearing in mind, we've already established that it's happening anyway, unless we're going to suggest that we take a vote to stop the ongoing work. <laughs> I'm happy to propose the recommendation. Thank you. May I have a seconder? Uh, proposed and seconded. All, all those in favour, please. It's passed. <coughs> um, moving on now to item 10, which um, is a decision the Council's got to take regarding um, the future um, governance of the Fire and Rescue Service. Um, <coughs> um, Steve, could you possibly take us through this? I was just, um. Thank you, Chairman. I've entitled this the consultation of the future of the Fire and Rescue Service because that's what I believe it is. Although the government's documentation does say, and it's a consultation over enabling closer working between the emergency services. But if you read the Minister's letter which we've enclosed, or you visit the website with the consultation document in it and read through those, it is a very pointed document. It doesn't actually ask you if there's a choice. They're basically saying, we've come up with this good idea. Do you think it's a good idea? And how could you suggest we improve it? And do you see there being any problems involved in that? Um, my feeling is that uh, is there's a degree of inevitability about this. So it kind of prompts two questions in my mind. Um, or a question in my mind about the future of the fire service. Obviously, in terms of the consultation, you can put forward two viewpoints. One, that it stays as it is with the local authority, or two, that you agree and support that the, this should fall to the police and crime commissioner. It's quite clear in the government's manifesto that they're looking to widen and broaden the remit of the police and crime commissioner. And to that end, they are certainly looking, in reading this documentation, of moving the fire service, and they've even drawn up plans and processes within the consultation document about how it will happen. Um, I'm not in a position where I can answer and, and fill out the consultation form without some guidance from the elected members on this island and this fire authority about how they feel I should respond to that because I think it's an important issue and you should respond in it and how you see the future of your fire service. Thank you. Um, Vice Chair. Yeah, um, as a member of the Police and Crime panel, I have actually spoken to other members of that panel and the general, <coughs> the general feeling is, uh, as with what Steve has just said, is that basically, the, as, as an organisation, the, the, the feeling cent was central, No, central government are strongly in favour of keeping them still. The, the current government is, but I mean, well, yes. be, 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 because so few people voted for, in, in the elections, you know, 10, 12% yeah, or whatever, that, there is that, an issue about that. that. The other, I mean, the other issue I was going to raise is that the Police and Crime Commissioner, as I understand it, is responsible for Devon and Cornwall. Am I right in thinking that the fire service actually is, that we have a service level agreement with, is just Cornwall? The, it's true. The way that the fire services are set up nationally are all different. All different, um, yeah. They form into various categories. In essence, Devon Fire and Rescue Service traditionally reported to Devon Council. That arrangement was broken a number of years ago when there was a reorganisation in local government. 
and you have a constituent fire board that in Devon was made up of um, the Torquay area, Greater Devon and Plymouth and they formed a fire committee. And that fire committee is elected members from each of those authorities that sit on the board and make the decisions about the fire authority. But in the legislation and the reporting process, they have no responsibility to report back to those local authorities on where the fire service goes. So the fire service and its governing body in those arrangements are almost autonomous. There's no answerability to the public. But what about Cornwall? Cornwall is the same as this. The fire authority is the council, and there are about 14 of those left throughout the British, uh, the British Isles, or England, should I say. And uh, that arrangement we have with Cornwall is that we have a service level agreement with Cornwall Fire and Rescue Service so that we can use their systems their management systems, their computer systems, their fire control to meet our needs, which, which substantially reduces our costs. In the event that this goes ahead, then the Police and Crime Commissioner will have the, uh, let's say, the powers to make arrangements where he can become um, subject to the appropriate process being followed, the controlling entity of a fire service for his area. So that would be Devon, Cornwall and the Isles of Scilly. And they've already anticipated that and there's a breakage mechanism that they anticipate should be in included in that to break the arrangement with Somerset that would go back to uh, the Avon pieces. So, so um, have members in Cornwall um, been indicated what their attitude is. I mean, have had a similar report to this, are you aware? Because, you know, clearly I, I, it would be pointless for us to have a service level agreement with them if they were quite happy to join yes, in with a, a police and crime commissioner. The, the answer to your question is that they are being consulted about that now, like yeah. we are. Um, so there is no decision and no response from Cornwall. Well, it, would, well, it would seem to me to be sensible to take into account what they are doing bef you know, before we, you know, because clearly we can't actually carry on with a service level agreement with them if they are not going to take any interest in us. In, in, I mean, in, the two, we, indeed, we, there needs to back, be... I'll come back to two points that I made earlier on. One, that the, uh, to answer your question about the Police and Crime Commission, it, the political situation is that this government are fully supportive of Police and Crime Commissioners and, and wish them to stay, and they will stay until at least the next, next election. This uh, operation of, of handing power as far as the fire service is concerned, if it goes through, which seems extremely likely anyway, um, will happen before the end of this parliament. So we are going to have to deal with that regardless. And I, I will just come back, rather than saying anything more, is that it appears that this, regardless of what we say, whether we support it or we don't support it, uh, looks like a done deal and, and we are going to have very little influence over the outcome of it regardless. I'm not being pessimistic, I'm trying to be realistic as far as that is concerned. Please. I, I still think that we need to sort of talk to Cornwall about this because, you know, there are clearly interests, we, there are shared interests here, certainly from our point of view. If I could just cover the service level agreement, we could make a service level agreement arrangement with any other fire authority. It doesn't necessarily have to be Cornwall. Um, and there are other, other options, such as management options, which have been explored and put into place between Hampshire and the Isle of Wight, where they take over the total running of the, of the fire and rescue service in the Isle of Wight without the transfer of staff. It's, uh, it's a quite a unique arrangement at the present moment. And whilst the government have endorsed those types of arrangements, um, they're saying there's not one fix fits all of it, but they are still very keen that this process should go ahead. But even if we remained, and that is one of the options is that, you, that you elect to make a representation that you remain independent. Uh, and what I've suggested in the paper is that there is a viewpoint that irrespective of, um, the, of the kind of streamlining of the fire service on the mainland and it being under the PCC, the, the actual contribution that this island would make to overall improvements of safety, arrangements on the mainland and all the rest of it is 
it just doesn't exist. So it would not affect any outcome or any business plan that they might put into place. So therefore, it might be reasonable to argue that you could remain independent. On the opposite side of that, there is obviously, at this present moment, you carry a responsibility as the fire authority for ensuring that fire-related issues are dealt with appropriately. And if they were not to be dealt with appropriately and we were found to be <coughs> lacking, not only would I be in the, in, in, in the seat and under scrutiny, but you also yourselves would be. And the authority, in a worst-case situation where there was an injury <coughs> or a death, particularly to a firefighter, is that you do have a responsibility in terms of um, being responsible for that, and you could face charges of corporate manslaughter. But that's true across the whole of your workforce. It's just that the fire service uh, in dealing with fires is a little bit more dangerous than doing some other things. Um, Steve, in your opinion, is, is, there, um, is there a risk that we won't get such good quality cooperation um, if it's transferred to the police and crime um, rather than the SLA with, with Cornwall? The SLA with Cornwall's worked very well, and um, it would be reasonable to expect that you're not going to see any difference in the level of service. Um, again, that would be about equipment and troops on the ground. In terms of your policy, and you have some policies that are uh, quite, um, <coughs> quite draconian in terms of what goes on in the mainland. So, for instance, Home fire safety visits are done almost annually on the off-islands and they're done every five years on this island. Uh, on the mainland, there are still great swathes of the country that have not had home fire safety risk inspections um, because they haven't got the resources to do it. But there's no reason why the council, even if it loses the responsibility for fire, could not seek to influence the PCC because the the ideology behind it is that you make one res person responsible for the delivery of that service, and if they don't do it, then you don't vote for them. So we would have a local man in charge. Uh, wouldn't necessarily be through the council, though. It would just be as part of the PCC. It'd be part of the... Yes, that's right. Um, and what, what would happen is instead of there being a chief officer for, let's say, Devon, a chief fire officer for Cornwall, and a chief fire officer for the Isles of Scilly, is there would be one responsible chief fire officer for the whole, yeah. and my view is that you'd come under West Cornwall, and there would be a whole time officer responsible for delivery of services on this island. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Neil, you've put your line. Thank you, Chairman. If you please bear with me, I'd just like to read out 623. Supporting the proposal and transferring the FRS would remove a significant risk area from the Council's service portfolio. Furthermore, it is anticipated that the provision of the service itself would not change as a result of this proposal. The only change would be the mechanism by which it's supported and serviced. I put it to you that that statement negates all of the counter-arguments given in 631 and answers most of the questions that we've been discussing for the last 20 minutes. Respectfully. Well, I think it's putting both sides of the argument is the way I, I see it, but... Um well, I think, I think that I personally only see an upside to that from that statement. It removes a significant risk area from the council service portfolio, and there will be no change as a result of this proposal to the provision of the service itself. Win-win. <laughs> That's the way I see it. Right. Well, thank you, Councillor David. Sorry, you've been waiting. Um, the fire chief has referred several times to fire services on this island. Is that just a typo? Do you mean these islands? I stand corrected, sir. <clears throat> I mean, I think that we've had conf not conflicting advice, but there is a, a range of advice. I mean, Vice Chair has explained that through his role with the Police and Crime Committee, that there is a wider intention from government to see um, fire services amalgamated in one form or another. Um, and having expressed that fairly strongly, I think that may well be um, the way that people, the government are hoping we will go. Um, Councillor Sims, have you got? Um, 
I completely uh, agree with what Councillor O'Neill said regarding 6.23, and then you've got 6.1 here. I mean, apparently, I mean, that seems to sum it up. The main options are to, to, we only have one option, which is does the Isles of City wish to maintain its own fire and rescue service? Um, see, I'm not altogether clear about if we have that option, given what um, Councillor Milson said initially. Yeah. Um, the way I look at it, if somebody else runs it, then obviously they're less focused on the place, but the marginal costs of doing stuff over here is much less, much smaller than it is for us. When it was enormous, when it's sort of low, very 0.0001 percent for them. Mm -hmm. So I think it works both ways. But if we have no option, which I suspect seems to be the case, I think that we should try and uh, mitigate the, any issues we will have with that one option. Um, yes, sir, Craig would like to come in on that point. Yes, Chairman, just to look at the two options, because, yeah, ab absolutely, in terms of option one, it would actually mitigate any risk in terms of ongoing liabilities in running the service. I think the one area where we need to be careful and the one risk for, for, for that we've identified in the report, or certainly uh, the Chief Fire Officer has, is the issue around revenue support grant. And that's the one area where I think we need to lobby central government to ensure that we still get the level of revenue support grant that we currently get without so so that is the one area of risk which we really need to be aware of and make sure that DCLG in terms of our annual settlement are fully aware of our concerns. Oh, yes, it's, it's, Sorry, it's, 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 the, it's the financial aspect of it that worries me as well because it's you know the, looking at um, items item five um, the strong implication of that is that is that it, we, we won't get as much money. Um, we'll have to argue very, or fight very hard to get as much money as we get already, although we don't even seem to know exactly how much money we do get. We think it's over £100,000, but we're not sure. Why aren't we sure? If I can clarify that, what, what traditionally has happened since the early 90s is that the <clears throat> Fire and Rescue Service nationally had a formulaic approach to revenue support grants, so there's a determined formula. But two items in that formula grossed up the amount that the Isles of Scilly got, and that was a coastline factor. And an agreement I made with the um, then um, Home Office was that they would use Cornwall's deprivation figures because there were none available for the islands. And that, those two significant markers put the funding up quite considerably for the Isles of Scilly. The rest of the British Fire Service still runs on that formula. And if you visit the Treasury's um, publications on revenue support grant, for each authority, whether it be a standalone authority like Devon and Somerset or whether it be Cornwall Council, you can see how much that formula produces and is given to the council for the running of their fire service. They don't have to use that. It's not ring-fenced. They can use it in other areas, and, and a lot of authorities do choose to, to, do, choose to do that. But since about um, 2007, 8, 9, somewhere around 2009, the Isles of Scilly, um, <clears throat> following representation made uh, by the Council, it was agreed by the Treasury that you would be funded by a revenue support grant that meets your needs. And that is what's in the publications from the Treasury when I checked only, only a couple of weeks ago. So, for my view, is you've been moved out of all of the formulaic approaches. You have a revenue support grant that meets your needs. Your needs to service your fire service are what you spend on its budget. So it is reasonable to conclude, and the head of finance agrees with me on this, is that you, all you would give up in that instance is what you spend on the fire service. So apart from there being some marginal costs around what you really cover for the fire service about running the council and its contribution to uh, council running, the rest of it would transfer to the PCC. They, they and even if you joined with Cornwall, Cornwall would, and the our silly fire authority as a new fire authority, would get that amount of money that would come from the formula. So that £100,000 top up because we don't get the figures now because we don't know, but a good estimate is £100,000 would go to the new authority, but it would be paid for by the DCLG. Uh, but, <coughs> but, that, but that's um, why we need to, you would need to lobby in this process, and we need to lobby in this process if it goes ahead to ensure that you maintain your individual 
process for getting your revenue support grant? That only applies if we went for option two, which was to retain. That's right. If I can just remind you, this is about how you wish to respond to the consultation. Do you want to say, no, we would like to retain the service because this is the best way of doing it on a small island with, a, with an understanding group of local councillors who understand the local needs, or are you quite happy to give all of that up and allow it to be delivered by an outside body, similar to the police and similar to the ambulance service and similar to the Coast Guard? Chairman. Um, <coughs> uh, Councillor Belsborough, uh, yeah, sorry, you had your question. Yes, on. Chairman. I hope we never have to discuss whether we start a third world war. We've been on this for 20 minutes and aren't much farther. My view is that it seems that <clears throat> if the fire service is going to be maintained, its efficiency at putting out fires, the thing we have to discover is which is the least financial risk to the council. If our option maintains the service, you know, efficiency, we need to know which is the least financial. It's as simple as that. We've done this for 20 minutes now, and we're still no nearer. Well, we've, uh, we've had some uh, an interesting uh, diverse views. Um, option one is very clear. It says reduce risk, no, no decline in service levels, if I'm correct. The money is basically rooted through another channel. Uh, the potential issue for the council is whether or not the money currently coming through RSG is uh, exactly matches the cost of the fire services, uh, i.e. possibly the council might be making a small surplus at the moment. Um, so that would be something that we had to lobby on in order to maintain the, the right level of RSG um, if, whether we vote or not, it seems to me that it's quite possible that option one might be forced upon us. Um, so I think option one has the caveat that we have to make sure that the, the lobbying to the relevant government department is almost part of the process. Um, Vice Chair, you. Yeah, a <clears throat> couple of points that I'd like to make these that if, if we decided to go it on our own, we would have to then set up SLAs for all the specialist and backup services that we've got at the moment, and I see that as an inherent risk to this authority as a massive risk. Whereas if we are going down the channel, which is suggested as far as uh, the PCC is concerned, that would be in place and it would be delivered unto us. Um, the other point that I'd just like to make is that regardless of which, this whole process as far as giving responsibility and the authority to the Police and Crime Commissioner, regardless of how we look at it, is, is a cost-saving measure as far as central government is concerned. Um, make no bones about that. They're looking at saving money on it. <clears throat> Councillor Sam, do you would like to be on sometime? Well, you, um, your co previous comments, whether what I wanted to say, whether it's cost neutral or maybe it makes a little bit of money, or, or um, I, I was thinking probably a mainland authority would think, great, let central government take it. Um, we have unique circumstances here, but I don't think that the fire service would be any worse off because it's the same people running it. And I mean, my view would be option two, really, but. I really feel like I don't know enough to make the decision at this stage. This is, this is the problem. Well, I think the point was well made by the Chief Fire Officer that um, the ambulance service and so yeah, on that, that are already that, that, op yeah. operating under a very similar type of regime. Well, I, I, that, that would shift me to option, to option two, certainly. No, option dispense One. with the function. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Daly, sorry. Chair, can we be told if this has any implications for the fire service at the airport? I, I personally, my understanding is that the, the, it doesn't change anything given that the airport is under a shifting regime in any case. Chairman, just very briefly, there's a service level agreement at the moment in place which I think is actually helpful because that service level agreement could actually be simply transferred to whoever the appropriate body might be. Uh, Councillor Van. I would support um, going with option one to dispense of the function. I think, as our Vice Chairman has said, it will be imposed on us. And I think, though, that we've got to be quite canny about how um, this authority has a monitoring role and um, keeping our eyes on the level and quality of service. 
so that we do have a mechanism whereby we can have some input when required. But it does offer, to my view, the um, uh, possibilities of real efficiencies of scale and um, the onus will be on the Police and Crime Commission to actually ensure that the quality does not deteriorate. <coughs> and we can keep them to that if we set up the right mechanism. Thank you very much. I, um, have we got a proposal from the Vice Chair? Um, I wasn't quite clear whether you had proposed option one or not. Uh, I don't know if, the, if your Vice I'll, I'll No, sorry, did, the Vice Chairman Council. Uh, Steve's Vice Chairman of the Council now, but I will propose option one. Would second it. I'll support it, Chairman. Yeah. <coughs> So we have a proposal and a seconder for option one, which let's just be clear exactly. Um, With the caveat that you stated yourself, Gemini, earlier on about the ensuring that we continue to lobby for adequate funding, yes, et cetera, yes. et cetera. Yes, <clears throat> and Chairman, just to, be just to clarify, if you look at 6.2.2, uh, 6 and it's the second sentence. However, in responding on the basis, the council will need to make appropriate representations, yeah. Yeah. which is the wording. So the proposal basically is option one, dispense with the function, but with the proviso that um, 6.22 is um, fully taken into account with regard to the RSG implications. Um, well, with, with a proposal and a second, uh, uh, could I? This is only a response to a consultation. Though. No, but we, I think we have to vote yeah. as to whether we... Yeah. We respond along those lines. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all, all, all those in favour, please raise. That's passed. Thank you. You've just voted for it. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, I beg your pardon. I thought I saw your hand go. Um, agenda item 11 is um, the road traffic order which um, applies for the, the um, Christmas events. Should I propose this? I'll second it. All those in favour? <laughs> is, is that in favour of Christmas? <laughs> um, I think that brings us to the end of our meeting. So, thank you very much indeed. At its eight minutes to 12, uh, 11. Oh.